So I think you've had enough lecture for now. What do you think? Yes. So it's your turn to work a bit. What I suggest we do is we do case studies. So we turn the thing around. Instead of giving you theory and then trying to what, seeing to what it could apply, I have selected a few situations so, as they were reported, sometimes very well, sometimes just more uh, simplistic. And uh, we use everything you know, we know, we've heard, to make sense out of them, right? So I ask the question and you will give the lecture. Good. So um, this is the first one. And you should be aware that as we go, it will become more complex and I'm going to pick on your heads. So don't be shy because um, here you have a graph coming from the States. Not absolutely recent, but that's the lar largest I found, 209, 217. On uh, cases and incidence rate of tetanus by age. And you have the fatal, non-fatal cases with different colors. So I would be interested for to know from project managers, for example, who see this type of data coming in, like how many cases, which age, blah, blah, blah. What do you get of this? What do you see? How would you describe this? What does it tell you? Start very descriptive. This is a graph showing that... <laughs> that... That I heard. Older people die. I heard. Winning immunity. I heard winning immunity. I heard older people die. Something else? You have to use your mic even if I don't ask for your names and all that. This is okay for this question because I, uh, for this session because I want it to be quick. So I didn't hear what was suggested. I said maybe lack of vaccine use in the older. Lack of vaccine use in the older. Okay, that all sounds very good. So nobody picked on, oh. On, on what is what does that mean? Why is this highest this higher case number between twenty and thirty? More exposed to accidents and more dangers. exposed? Okay. So from that you could raise several hypotheses. Kids, few cases, because they are followed by pediatricians who are known how to give what, when, and so on. Then adolescent escape. Right. Young adult, even worse. And as you get old, so I heard two different hypotheses. One was winning immunity, and the other one was failure to get boosted. Maybe it's different. Maybe it's the same. How do you differ? What would you do to investigate that? If you see that and you see the highest incidence is in older, older adults um, and you want to prevent this, what's the next step? Stratify the data by vaccine coverage. Yes. Last vaccine date. Good luck. If you ask a 12-year-old, it's already not always easy. If you have... Well, the elderly... Of the, I don't know how it's in your place, but... Even in strict Switzerland, uh, finding the date of the last tetanus shot is not always easy. But you could, if you wanted to investigate, you could like at serum look at serum antibodies, right? Mm -hmm. To see is it do they have, do they still have antibodies? Do they not? Okay, let's do that. So here you have by age, the ranges are a bit different. Tetanus specific antibodies in males and in females. So what do you see? Males have better immunity as they get older than females. That's one observation. Any idea why this is the case? Higher exposure? You think a male would do more gardening than women? 
That would be special. But maybe. Yes, but accident is not a very important source of tetanus. Sorry? Extra shots where? In workplaces, in the army, mostly. Ah, I don't know how it's now, but when this was uh, published 20 years ago, the army, especially men, so they get booster shots. And despite the fact that women live longer, they are uh, uh, so... so. Excuse me? Yeah? Yep. Who, who spoke? My name is Michael. Yeah, sure. From Sorry, Nigeria. So yeah. I'm just wondering, I don't know how it is in Switzerland, but uh, where I come from in Nigeria, women are more likely to get boosters during their pregnancy. So this picture might be different for yes. Southern Africa. What is the upper age of pregnancy in Nigeria? Uh, well, I have seen uh, people in their early 50s who are pregnant. Yes. Yes. Early 50? Yes, I have seen. It's not common, but I've seen. So it's difficult to... What, what is the life expectancy in Nigeria? I thought it was about 55. Yes, but I've seen women... Well, okay, well, so that's the extreme right, yeah, of the curve, right? Yes, yes. So it means that those over 70 or 80 would not have been boosted for I mean, a long time. So we can make up any hypothesis. So that's somehow that's what I want to show you, is that you look at data, you raise hypotheses, you look. But if you look at that, you realize that two things. One is that there is a disparity between male and female. And maybe you may want to catch it up because female do more gardening, because female uh, uh, live longer, because and so on. So you may want to have a special program for a uh, uh, woman. I'm not saying you should, but I mean, this is a gender disparity, so we should address it, right? And then there is another thing that is interesting. Nobody noticed, but what do you think the, of the level of seroprotected persons over 70? It's very low. Okay? It's very, very low. 20%, 40%. And yet, over a decade here, there was all age confounded, only 264 cases. So tetanus is a very rare disease. And even if you don't have immunity, you may never get it. Because if you're not exposed, or if you're exposed and you clean the, the wound rapidly, or blah, blah, blah. So sometimes when asked, Oh, there are too many vaccines in this schedule. You probably heard this. I said, well, I agree with you. There are many vaccines. So if I had to take out one, I would take out tetanus. <laughs> so there would be no outbreak, just individual consequences. Of course, if you've seen someone dying from tetanus, you don't, you don't want to see that again. But it's only an individual problem. Very good. So... The first takeout is that non-communicable diseases remain rare even if there is no vaccine-induced protection because most of the not-so-young uh, American citizens do not have any antibodies against tetanus and yet they do not get the disease. Second, this is reported diphtheria cases in Canada over a long period of time. And as you see, quite easily, Diphtheria disappears. So how could this be achieved? Vaccination and uh, antibiotics. antibiotics. Well, let's, let's stick on vaccination, but which type of schedule? Do you think Canadians are much better at boosting adults than the U.S.? No. How can, but that's your hypothesis, but how can you tell? Look at antibodies. Okay? So if you look at antibodies compared to tetanus antibodies, which I showed you before, do you think they would be higher or lower? Higher. Oh, yes? Remember what I said about the, immuno, the relative immunogenicity of tetanus being really strong and diphtheria being really low? So, in fact, the immunity against diphtheria, the antibodies against diphtheria, even in young adults like you, is very low, right? So that's not the explanation. But let's imagine you say, okay, it's because they keep on boosting. Okay. Now, 
These are diphtheria cases reported from the WHO African region. What do you say? What do you see? No reported cases. What is the recommended schedule for diphtheria in the African region? And 6 and 14, okay, and then when do we boost? And then? And then? Stop. And, and yet the coverage of at five years, we don't know what it is. It is very heterogeneous. Okay. Um, okay. Pregnancy, uh, may get, they may get some DT at some point. So how, how can that be explained? No circulation. no circulation is one. I'll come back to that. What could be the other explanation you have to, to be aware of as a program manager? No reporting. No reporting, under-reporting, if you're blamed for reporting, if you, I mean, all these type of things. If you, you if you have a lot of paperwork to do, if you report a case, uh, say, oh, let's forget about this one, and so on. Okay? So, let's go back to lack of circulation. Community protection with no boosting in the adults. How is that achieved? Think of what you just learned from Adam. Uh, mucosal immunity was the title of his presentation. <laughs> You're not going to win a, a, a book with this. Reduce transmission. Reduce transmission because where does diphtheria uh, live? In the throat of whom? Of young kids. So if you immunize young kids, that's enough. You don't need to give diphtheria boosters to the adult population. And we've seen that in the former USSR when there was huge outbreaks when there were, when they stopped immunizing children for various reasons. But no outbreak when they stopped immunizing adults but were immunizing uh, kids. Okay? So if you target well, and if you have a niche of uh, like meninge in adolescent, uh, although it's more spread, but, but uh, diphtheria in young children, that all you need is target that age group. And then indeed, we could have tetanus boosters instead of DT. Okay, it would be just the same. Very good. So community immunity may mask or compensate for the fact uh, that there are individual vaccine failures because if these unvaccinated African let's say, adults would go to a, an area where there was an outbreak of diphtheria, they would be at very high risk, right? And there are uh, still outbreak of the diphtheria at some point in some places in the world. So that this is uh, for travel vaccines and, and important things for expats and things like that to consider. Okay, so I think this one I like a lot, mumps. This is um, a paper which reported an outbreak of mumps student, mumps cases, they were more than 2,000 cases. And there were young adults. Median age was 25, uh, 21 years. Two-thirds had parotitis. And the reported complications were as listed, including hospitalizations, fortunately no death. And believe me, this is exactly the same pattern and in proportion as well as the type and frequency of complication as you have with wild-type mumps when you have not been uh, uh, immunized. And this is one study, but there were others. So the first thing you would say is these kids have not been immunized, right? Because they have wild-type mumps. But you look at their immunization records. This is in the U.S. This is serious. 77 to 97%, depending on the schools, of the students had had two doses of vaccine. And yet, they had mumps, which was not even attenuated, which was like white-type mumps. So, what could contribute, and there are many, there are several right answers, what are the factors that could generate this? One, two, three, yes. Okay, you select those who were not vaccinated, but here, the 70, let's say, 90% were vaccinated. See? So... Winning immunity could be one. Different variants, mutation. 
a bad batch of vaccine. Although my understanding is you go to college from many, many different places and you've been immunized like 20 years ago. So it would be really, well, let's say we just come up with hypothesis. Problem with the vaccine. Migrants. Do they go to college uh, from uh, maybe? I hate it when we put uh, the blame uh, for viruses on, on migrants, but sometimes it, it's the case. Who else said something? Oh, yeah, I like that one. Dormitories. Yeah. Huh? That's a, that's a huge one. Okay. Can we think of something else? What, what the, about, yeah? Co-infection with like what? Flu or something else that would then favor mom's friends? Why not? Never heard of, but we have to be creative. No, no, they are very healthy college students. Uh, well, of course, uh, they were not on the same day, right? It was like always you have an epidemic curve. It goes like that. And then we come with a dose of vaccine and then we stop the outbreak. So what do we know? First, there can be some primary vaccine failure. So mumps is a very, very, very attenuated vaccine. The strain we use nowadays is over attenuated, such that it has no, it induces no adverse reaction, no aseptic meningitis anymore, but it is much less effective than the mumps strains we used to use when I was your age. So we traded off Reactogenicity for efficacy. That may remind you of other vaccines where that happened. Pertussis, for example. So there is some primary vaccine failure, for sure. Secondary vaccine failure, so losing immunity over time, is a very likely possibility. But then that means probably losing both B and T cell responses, because otherwise you should have at least fewer complications. And so this suggests that if you use a very, very, very attenuated vaccine, you may do some good initially, and then unless you reach eradication, which is you maintain a, a very high coverage, as soon as you have high viral load because of close contact into dormitories, you find the pockets and the virus uh, 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 moves around. And yes, you were right. Uh, uh, the, it was questions a lot about the, whether the, the mismatch between vaccine and outbreak strains, which we see when we look at uh, nucleotides, whether it uh, contributes or not. I think the jury is still not out on this one. But the, the beliefs today is that the, although vaccines were derived decades and decades ago, they still neutralize the strains that circulate. Otherwise, we would have much more, much larger and frequent uh, uh, outbreaks. So I think this is a very interesting case because it shows that uh, a vaccine that is doing its job is only doing it unless a number of cumulative factors uh, uh, happen. And of course, this is then very detrimental to public health because it's, oh, your vaccine don't work because some were hospitalized and so on and so on. Very good. Um, very similar slide. I don't have time to show the data, but for pertussis. Uh, and some of you are pertussis experts, and I alluded to the fact that uh, now we have more primary vaccine failure with acellular pertussis than with whole cell pertussis vaccines. We certainly have a huge problem of secondary vaccine failure, uh, and the more you boost, the, the less effective it becomes. Um, and uh, reduction of natural boosting could also be an issue because uh, there is less circulation, um, and I've, I'm not sure here about mismatch issues because apparently strain with or without pertactin, for example, do not make much of a difference. I don't know if they are pertussis expert, and I think this comes also later in the years. Um, so this to me is also an example of where we thought we were doing right was 1985, hey, fantastic, we have a vaccine that is much less reactogenic, a bit less protective, you know, we went from 95% to 85% in infant, but it was still very, very good, and now, 40 years later, we realize we were better off with whole cell vaccines, so at this point, I usually say, if you're in a country 
who still, which still uses whole cell vaccine for infants, go to your prime minister and tell him, stick with it. If you've moved too late, difficult to go back, stick with it as well, but, <laughs> but give a boost to your pregnant woman. And this will be uh, covered again next week. Okay? Okay, so vaccine may not induce sustained protection. And there can be numerous potential contributing factors to that. And I think it echoes what uh, Andy was saying earlier. When we look for correlates, there is a bit of that and that and that and that. And all of a sudden, you have all together and you have an outbreak or you have a situation that you would not want to have to, to manage. Uh, here um, is hepatitis. And um, probably all of you know, but uh, if not, I'm going to uh, uh, summarize it quickly, that if you are exposed to hepatitis virus, and at time of exposure, you have neutralizing antibodies over 10 milli units per mil, that's not very important, these antibodies are going to neutralize the virus immediately as it enters the body, so, or very rapidly, so you have some viral replication, you have an acute infection that takes place in the liver, but nevertheless, uh, you are going to have infection control very easily and uh, health. So none of the vaccine we use today prevent infection. This is something I wanted to make clear. Measles vaccine doesn't prevent infection. It prevents disease, chickenpox, you name it. We never prevent infection. We, we don't have yet a single vaccine inducing sterilizing immunity, maybe for a very, very short period, uh, the first two weeks after. But it is so quick that the virus enters a cell and then replicates, propagates uh, from cell to cell that we never have sterilizing immunity. Okay? So we know from this that if you have more than 10 uh, uh, milli units of uh, anti uh, bodies against HBS antigen at time of exposure, you are protected against hepatitis B, acute hepatitis B. But nobody cares for acute hepatitis B, right? Because most of the time it's asymptomatic. So what our programs are targeting is chronic hepatitis B with the risk of cirrhosis and cancer and all this. So what is required for vaccines to protect against chronic hepatitis B? Who knows? Do you need to maintain 10 mil unit of antibodies at all time to be protected? No. Because of cell response. cell response, that's a bit vague. We, it's true, but uh, what? Memory. Memory of which type of memory? Every cell, uh, most, many cells get memory. T cells? B cells. Okay. What happens if you are exposed to hepatitis B when you have less than the level of antibodies that prevent uh, uh, infection? You have infection, you have acute infection, but within, and this is something you may want to remember, it takes maximum a week, between four and seven days, for memory B cells to generate antibodies that are usually at a high enough titers to interfere, stop, neutralize an infection. And this was shown with Hib, this was shown with PCB, this is shown with hepatitis B. So it's more or less of a generic phenomenon. The time between uh, antigen and antibody uh, risk, uh, uh, encountering the shot and the time at which you have enough antibodies to do something is between four and seven days. Okay? So because you reactivate your memory cells that are doing nothing, they rapidly produce a lot of antibodies. And in fact, you don't, you can, you still get acute infection because the, the virus is going to go into the cells, but you prevent the infection from becoming chronic and from so on and so on. So you do not need to keep on boosting. You give three doses at zero, one, six months, for example, and that's it. Because then you have memory cells sitting in your lymph nodes, a little bit in the blood, but mostly in the lymph nodes in the bone marrow. And if antigen appears at some point, 
within four to seven days, they will raise antibodies. Now, what is important is what is the time taken required for between initial viral replication and acute infection? And I wrote it here, it's between one and three months. So if it take one between one and three months to have hepatitis, and within a week you have enough antibodies to cut it down, that's an easy game. Okay? So the time, the comparison of the time of the incubation of the disease and the four to seven days is a key parameter of whether memory is going to be helpful or not. This is the classical example, and uh, uh, this is why we can say that protection may persist after the disappearance of vaccine-induced effectors, so antibodies or T-cells, and it demonstrates the role of uh, 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 immune uh, memory. But there, are more t- there is more to that. And so I would like to ask you, under which circumstances is memory sufficient or not for protection? And what I suggest is that you list into, you tell me which vaccines or which disease you would put in column, whether uh, memory is sufficient for protection or memory is not sufficient for protection. So give me some example and tell me where, uh, if you think memory is sufficient or not. Varicella what? Varicella. Varicella is sufficient because... Because incubation is th- three weeks. Okay. Rabies. You can even do post-exposure and it works very well. The risk of uh, rabies with post-exposure, even long after exposure, because it's so slow. Very good. What else? Sorry? Measles. Okay, measles, mumps, rubella, all these viruses that take several weeks. For all, for this, this is sufficient. Which one? COVID not sufficient? Okay. COVID not sufficient. We'll discuss that. Influenza what? Not sufficient? Okay. Malaria? Uh, I don't know. What's the incubation time of malaria? Okay. Let's see what I have here as a graph. The idea is exactly what I said before. You have the Invasion of the pathogen starts colonizing, multiplying, and you have the host response that starts kicking in. The incubation period is uh, on the bottom, and after four days, you have a quick reactivation of memory B cells, and if this is quick enough compared to the incubation period, you have no disease. You have an infection, but you have no disease, so you don't know that you had the infection. Right? But If the reactivation of memory cells is slower than the incubation period of the pathogen, then memory is not enough. So can you give me examples where memory is not enough? Because you gave me a lot of examples where memory was enough. So which are the bugs for which incubation is shorter than four to seven days? Influenza. Then you have the shift in strains. So, Uh, no. Flu and influenza, I think it's pretty close. Come on, a bug. Meninge. Hib. What else? Hib, pneumo, meninge, influenza. Short incubation time. Memory is unlikely to be sufficient. Prolonged incubation, these are the examples. There are many others. So this is a basic principle. It's like written in the Bible. Now everybody accepts this. But there is another parameter that is often uh, overlooked. What really makes this important is the comparison of the times for the antigen to reach the lymph node and trigger reactivate memory compared to the time for infection to proceed, okay? So this implies that you need the antigen to reach the draining lymph node. Now, there are certain diseases where this does not occur. Can you think of one? A disease where 
you are not boosted if you're exposed. A disease for which there is a vaccine, an outstanding vaccine, for which even if you lose antibodies and you get exposed, you don't boost your responses. If I tell you more, I give you the answer. <laughs> A disease, a disease which, a vaccine which is mainly given to women, although it should be given also to men. <laughs> so what happens with HPV? You get infected. Don't tell me how you get infected. You get infected, and then where is the antigen? Where is the virus? On the, on the mucosa. Okay. And where does it go from there? Nowhere. No viremia, no chance of bringing antigen to the memory cells that are in your axillary or inguinal or whatever uh, lymph nodes. And, and we have data, beautiful data for, for, for that for women who were followed and lost antibodies to 18, whatever, then were exposed, we know, were PCR positive, so we know they were infected. No reactivation of, of immunity. So you need the antigen to reach the lymph node. So strictly mucosal infections do not reactivate memory, which means memory does not help. And this is why for this type of disease, you need to maintain effectors like antibodies forever and ever or as, as long as you need protection. And so HPV is the best example. But I suspect that pertussis is the same problem. And we did a bit of work with Dennis uh, on that because pertussis is also strictly a, a mucosal infection. You never see pertussis semia, if, even in a severely immunosuppressed patient that does not exist. And I suspect that it's part of the reason why we have such poor uh, lasting uh, immunity. Now, you understand the concept? I think that's interesting and important. And someone mentioned SARS-CoV-2 or COVID, and I said, we'll come back to that. So how do you define what you need to know to define the role of memory against SARS-CoV-2? Do you think memory protects or not? From what we see? Yes. The severity is much less, although you're going to get a runny nose. By the way, why do you get a runny nose and don't you, don't you get any complication? T cells protect from complication. Antibodies not high enough to protect the mucosal. So you need a little bit of antibodies to protect against amia, so means a bug in the blood. You need more to protect the lung, whether it's pneumo or anything. And you need even more to protect the upper respiratory uh, tract. So we know that there is some protection. So what does it imply in terms of duration of immunity, of incubation? Well, this is, I don't know if there, if there is more data, recent data because uh, that was last year. But there is a very large outlayer in the incubation period between exposure and, and coming down with symptoms. So 2 to 14 days mean for a few patients, 2 to 3 to 4 days may be too short for memory to reactivate. But in most patients, and of course you see what the curve is like, in most patients this is going to be to have some existing memory, even if you lose serology, don't do serology, uh, even if you uh, lose your antibodies, even if effector T cells are not detectable, is going to reduce the severity, even without shifting from a more uh, or to a less uh, pathogenic strain, so even strain specific. Okay. So I think these are important things to put in place uh, uh, when you think how do vaccines work or not work, because this explains why in some cases you have an, you absolutely need to boost to maintain responses, and in others you can just let it go. Prime and and with hepatitis A, same thing. Give one dose and forget about it, and no more liver transplant in Argentina, uh, uh, in kids. Since uh, I don't know, I mean you. Have, you need a time for this program to develop into uh, uh, adults, but uh, to to introduce one single dose at the age of one year, someone is from Argentina? Yes, here. Uh, 
cut down totally the liver transplant no zero to zero. So that's fantastic. Okay, so the presence of immune memory is not sufficient to protect against rapid or strictly mucosal infections. And I think that's interesting to keep in mind because the, these type of principles are often the only thing we have when a new pathogen emerges. Like, um, I don't remember if it was, I think it was Andy, uh, who said when SARS-CoV-2 started, we knew nothing about this pathogen. But very rapidly, we could have some information on incubation duration, on this type. This was quite fast. So putting things all together uh, uh, helps you understand uh, what you observe and then adjust your program uh, or your vaccines or choose your priorities and your targets and, and all that. So I thought this was a few examples of uh, of uh, of interesting situations. But the most important slide is this one. Frankly, much remains to be studied because there are many, many, many situations where we do not yet understand. Um, and I think at every table at lunch, at every lunch and dinner and breakfast and for two weeks, you're going to discuss situations. And sometimes the best answer is we don't know. We don't know because we don't have the data so we can speculate but we don't know. So uh, this is what I had prepared up front in order for you to have time, and we have almost 10 minutes for that, uh, to ask any questions to what was covered today. And again, if I say very good question next week, <laughs> it don't feel bad, okay? And priority to those who are, whose voice I have not yet heard. Are there any? Okay, let's start here, and then you, and then we'll go around. Thank you. I want to ask, with the mumps outbreaks in um, in college students, uh, in Belgium, we it's one of the reasons that we didn't want to lower the, the age of our MMR2 vaccine too far. Do you think that's indeed helpful, or do you think there's anyhow, I mean, we're giving it at about 10, 10 years of age? Yeah, um, it's anyway anyhow too long by the time they get to college. And yes, it won't I, I think it doesn't make much of a difference. Some also discuss giving a third dose, blah blah blah. It depends on how which proportion of your college students are into dormitories because if they sleep at home or sleep together, quote unquote, uh, uh, that makes all the difference. Um, and the more the most cost effective action is as soon as you see cases go up, give a dose to everyone. And that's enough not to reach 2,000 cases. But you have to be quick. I mean, if it's a Friday, it's a Friday. And you get them on Saturday, you give them a boost. You don't look for immunization records. You don't care. You just give a, a boost to everyone, and then they'll be, they should be okay. Yes. Yeah, for hepatitis B, the... Uh, je sais pas où est-ce qu'il est, mon, mon cher, si tu veux distribuer les questions, moi, sinon, je le fais, mais OK. Uh, sorry. For, for hepatitis B, um, the recommendation for the birth dose is that it needs to be within the first yes. 24 hours. But if it's, if the infection, um, the, the, From the it's mother? A slow, it's a slow infection, why do we have to give it within the first Okay, that's hours? a very good point. The problem, so exposure takes place at birth, right? Not before, we are lucky, Ex compared to other viruses. So exposure takes, takes place at birth. Um, a vaccine dose is not immediately effective. It's not because you shot, shoot, that the next day you're protected. So you have this one to two months incubation time. It can be between one and three. And in the infant, it's more one than three, where the infection is ongoing. So this is why we say you have to give the first two doses really close, at, start at birth, and don't forget the second dose, because that the first dose of antibodies at birth raises no antibodies. You can make a serology one month later, you, you, but it primes. And so you give the second dose, and then you have antibodies, and then you can wait for the sixth dose. And in very privileged countries, we add antibodies, immunoglobulins, to cover this one month period where the priming, the neonatal priming has not yet induced antibodies. But statistically, it adds a few percent, and any case of chronic hepatitis that can be 
avoid it. This is a good thing, but it's very costly and in most of the world not used. So the main thing is to give the first dose as soon as you can. Yes. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like clarification on the HPV and pertussis that you should have insufficient memory. Yeah. I am quite confused because uh, I think HPV would have a longer incubation period. Yes, from the, absolutely. So there are two different things. Uh, one is the incubation period. If it's long, immune memory has enough time to be reactivated. But what does immune memory need to be reactivated? Exposure. Exposure. Antigen. Antigen where? In the lymph node. And the problem is if the antigen remains on the mucosa, and to be specific on the oral or genital mucosa, it's not draining to the lymph node. So it's not reactivating memory cells. So HPV vaccines are fantastically effective because they maintain plateau. And I don't never know what Rafi is going to show because he is a creator. So it's never twice the same. He may show some of these or other parts of memory. We will see. But uh, uh, he was involved in, in, in studies which showed that you have decades of persistence of antibodies following immunization with a number of vaccines. Mm -hmm. And in this situation, you don't need migration of the antigen from the mucosa to the lymph node. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so this is proven for HPV. And it's my suspicion shared with others, but not proven because difficult. But I think there are a lot of arguments to suggest that it is the same problem with pertussis, that we are not boosted by natural exposure. Uh, it takes very several weeks until serology becomes positive and so on and so on. So there are many, many arguments for that. So, yeah, I still have a few minutes. Oh, no, no. Yes, sorry. Those who get desperate, it's good. What is the role of T cells in uh, mucosal infections and vaccines related to mucosal infections? Like which ones? HPV. In HPV? Uh, I would say HPV, I think, is easy. The mediator of infection is antibodies. So you need T cells to make good and long lasting bone marrow plasma sites that produce antibodies for decades. So these are the T cells that you need. But during infections... Following cells, immunization. Yeah, for infections, the T cells... Uh, following infection, it's different, of course. Following infections, you have T cells to a number of epitopes and different proteins and so on, which contribute to clear the, the infection from the... Of course, to clear the infection in 90% of the, those infected and in 10%, roughly, Unfortunately, the lesion will persist and eventually become uh, neoplasia of increasing grade. You will have a, a, a lecture on HPV totally dedicated to that. Thank you. So, you and then you, I don't think I heard you before. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, what do you think uh, about the synthetic yeah. cell targeting vaccine? Oh, uh, they... Joker. <laughs> it is possible. I don't know if uh, this uh, this vaccine kind of vaccine can improve the antigen, very mucosal antigen presentation to lymph node by using the dendritic cell design. I think with the data that we have today, it's a bit of a myth. But it may become it may be it may become a reality at some point in personalized vaccine against cancer, because I think that's the main di direct route where you have time, you take the person's blood, you extract, amplify in, in the lab, make a bulk, a bunch of dendritic cells, autologous, so from the same person, you train them, activate them, blah, 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 and then put them back. So therapeutic vaccines against cancer, I think dendritic cells could, are, will be playing a role. But in public health program for prevention, no way. Too costly, too difficult. 
And I think you have the last one. Yeah, two more, and then Rafi has one at the end. Okay, perfect. And Rafi got the last. Uh, uh, Why do some uh, vaccines produce uh, persistent, um, uh, sustained, uh, even lifelong immunity like yellow fever vaccine? And and, um, why why, is there a role in um, of T cells in uh, for chronic hepatitis B? (laughs) So, what was the question about yellow fever? So, Um, why why does some vaccines produce uh, you know very long very long lasting? Okay, so so these are generally the live replicating vaccine. Remember the slide where I showed that they replicate everywhere. So you have more antigen, you induce more cells, you have more long live plasma cells and, and possibly more antigen that persist and reactivate the cells. So live replicating vaccines in general induce longer lasting uh, uh, immunity. And the other exceptions or two, uh, two um, vac- licensed vaccines that do that very well are hepatitis B and HPV. Where When I look at their structure, I see very dense arrays of proteins that are densely packed and probably just at the right conformation for these cells to recognize them well. And uh, it's a bit of what Adam showed you when they're trying to produce uh, examers of whatever, you know, playing with the antigen structure in order to try to improve uh, uh, this. So currently, these are the two parameters that we know to induce uh, long-lasting antibodies. I think better time uh, with something that replicates or prime, prime, and boost as often as, as you need, uh, you have no other choice. Je sais plus qui c'est, moi je suis perdu maintenant. Over there. I have a question just for clarification. Did I understand correctly that you said that an ant- for HPV, an antigen from a vaccine does travel to lymph nodes and induce yes. long term memory? Yes. But an antigen from infection no. doesn't. Okay. Correct. And there is good data for that. Sometimes I told you these are my speculation. This is this is supported by data. <laughs> so I yeah. think yeah, you have been... Uh, Roughly the, last yes. question. Sorry. Yeah. For that. No, over there. It's always a pleasure. Yes. It works. Always a pleasure to, uh, to listen to your quiz. I always learn something from your quizzes. So, But I want to make a comment about HP. Uh, one important parameter to keep uh, into consideration is the replication cycle of HPV. So the first inf- cell that gets infected is the epithelial cell at the base of In that cell, no L1 or L2 are expressed. No viral particles are made in that initial cell. It's only when you get the replicating epithelial cells and you're getting the wart or the papilloma, then only at the outside edge are the viral particles made. So L1 and L2 are not expressed at the basal cell. And that's one of the reasons why the HPV infection never induced very good antibody to L1, L2. But the vaccine did because you were then delivering the L1 protein systemically. So that's also a consideration in terms of... The the wart grows toward the outside and never crosses the membrane, uh, basal membrane. Yeah, so it doesn't reach the blood and the does does it not reach the thank you. I'm relieved that you didn't destroy my entire presentation. <laughs> and I look forward to yours. <laughs>